everyone. Thank you for coming. We're going to start today with an invocation from Reverend Christina Spotty. Spirit of life and love, spirit of justice and mercy, spirit of all, known by many, many names among them, God. We are gathered here today in your presence, in this place, on this ground, to honor the history of this church built for the gathering of Universalists for generations to come. Those who designed and built this church would not have foreseen its future. The evolution of our faith over more than a century. It was built for whatever might come, and it has and will continue to serve their and our vision, to serve the life of a congregation. Blessings, dedications, memorials, weddings, worship, potlucks, events, sanctuary, and more. Our religious forebears, who I'm not sure would know what to make of who we've become as a people, I wonder what they would think if they were here to see this place now. What I know for certain is that like many here today, I am struck every time by its beauty. The building and grounds mutually enhance each other with just enough contrast, with a simplicity but boldness that reflects our faith, with the vibrancy of so much life. Today we give thanks for all of you here, all who have made this moment possible, all those who dreamed of this congregation and its church, as well as the future we hold space for becoming. As we receive this marker, may we continue the legacy of being good and faithful stewards of the past, present, and future. This we pray in the name of all that is good and right and true. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Christina, and thank you, Bonnie Whitehurst, for the lovely harp music while we were gathering. <laughs> I'm glad all of you could join us today. I'm Kathy Hopkins, the former president of UUCTS, and also the leader of our uh, team that worked on the marker project on our end. So welcome today. Um, Today we're going to celebrate this moment in history and appreciate the strong ties to our community that formed in the 1800s but continues today. We are very excited to be receiving this marker from the City of Tarpon Springs and the Tarpon Springs Area Historic Society. It's a joint effort between the two and we are so excited. So today we'll have Mayor Costas speak to us and we will also have the president of the Historic Society, Ed Hoffman. And we will also hear from the great granddaughter of the guy that built the church, Jill Noblet McGregor. Um, and then after that, we'll recognize some of our esteemed guests that are here with us. And then um, just before the dramatic unveiling, uh, Lynn Whitelaw will say a few words to us and then we'll call a few folks up and unveil the marker. So let's start with Mayor Costas. Well, thank you for having me. I never uh, prepare uh, talks or speeches at these. I just try and speak from just who I am and growing up here in Tarpon Springs. And, you know, we talk about history, but uh, three generations ago, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of history here. And so this is history now. And for Tarpon Springs, unlike many of the other areas that are much older, three or 400 years old, uh, you know, we need to still learn that history is, is, um, is not cheap. It takes money and we need to keep up with it. And um, if we don't, we blink, something else happens and we lose a little bit of that history. So I'm very proud of everything that's been done here. I watched it from the sinkholes 
Um, I don't recall the fire, but I, I recall the, I recall the, the uh, although I'm beginning to think I'm getting to that age, um, I, I do recall the sinkholes and that was a real problem. So um, I want to congratulate everybody here and thank you for your, I, I hate to say it, the investment, but certainly your compassion of keeping up with everything that you've got here. You're doing your part. I'd like and I hope that everybody else in town does their part as well. So thank you very much. I want to say good morning, but I guess it's really good afternoon. Um, Costa stole a lot of my talk. I think he was looking at my notes that I had. Actually, I'm probably going to go off, off script. But, you know, what makes, you know, this town, Tarpon Springs, has this beautiful waterfront. You know the the bayou it it's scenic beauty all the waterfront that uh you know of course we're the venice of the south uh, we have um, beautiful beaches we have beautiful architecture we have new things and old things and all of those things that were uh that are quite wonderful and we also have whoops a, a group of wonderful wonderful people and uh those things are are all special but um, but they're not totally unique. Uh, there are other communities that have those, but we do have what we do have that really makes us unique is besides the, the special, diverse cultural uh, group of people, uh, we have this wonderful history that were, was made by a lot of really very interesting people. And that fascination, I think, is, is something really, really special and makes us unique. I know. Trinity is is a great place to live, from what I understand, but they don't have yet. Uh, give them another 100 or 200 years, maybe they'll have what we have a little bit. But until then, uh, you know, we are very, very special. I mean, that's what makes not me, but we, uh, our city, our group, becomes very, very special. And I talk about our history as kind of the soul of the community. Uh, that we can look back uh, on on things that happened here. I know that Mr. S uh, Governor Safford was just across the way here when he started putting all this together. And so anyway, I'm just so proud of that. I'm also just here to tell you as the president of the Historical Society, how grateful I am to the city of our partnership and, and Kieran and Costa and, and everybody that's involved with the city to, to bring what is this history is we have a we have a wonderful museum uh, downtown in the uh, you know the depot. Uh, we have a, a wonderful cultural center, a heritage center. Whoops. Uh, so we have those things in uh, Safford House. We have these wonderful things with history, but they have closing hours. Um, this this thing that we're putting up today and failing today is going to be here 24/7. So. So anybody can come if they come into the historic district and learn, and not only the, the new people uh, or the new residents, or some of us that have been here, like Costa and I, since our childhood, you know, uh, all our lives, because I'm constantly learning new things about our history and say, wow, what about that? So anyway, I'm just so grateful for this program that brings the, the, all those museums and all those things to a spot out here the people passers-by can can relive and imagine what it was like to be here uh, so many years ago. And with that, I'm just I'm just grateful, and I'm grateful to the city and 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 everyone here uh, for helping us celebrate that. Thank you. All right, I will now introduce you to Jill Noblet McGregor, the great granddaughter of G.E. Noblet, who built this structure and many others in Tarpon Springs and whose name is on the plaque. Jill? <laughs> I am gonna stay on script because this is someone else's story and not my own. <laughs> so, um... Today is indeed an exciting day for the congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs, which was originally organized under the name of the Universalist Church of the Good Shepherd in 1885. Yet regardless of the name changes, relocation, and renovations that occurred over these some 125 plus years, 
The Universalist congregation has been part of this Bayou community since its beginning. Living among the town's earliest names and church organizers, like Webster, Safford, and Cheney, was a young church member by the name of Grandma Edwin Noblet Sr., who came to be known by his initials, GE. Originally from Pennsylvania, GE came to Tarpon in 1884 at the age of 22. He did that after visiting the town, or visiting the town during a break in his building project over in Tampa at the Knight and Wall Hardware Store. In short order, GE moved and settled in Tarpon where he later married and raised his family. And that's how, four generations later, I was born the great granddaughter of GE. Then in 2006, along with my father, GE Noblet III, I decided to compile my great grandfather's legacy. And in doing so, we made many interesting and time forgotten discoveries during our research. It's because of one of those discoveries that I'm standing here before you today. Now back to 1884. And so it was that GE with his construction skills tucked in his back pocket, along with his love for this town and the outdoors, decided to join forces with Safford, Cheney, Webster, Diston, and Demons to invest his energy, insight, and abilities in the future of Tarpon Springs. The town continued to move forward with great success until a devastating fire broke out in the downtown sector in 1908. With the primary construction material of that time being wood, you can imagine the number of businesses and buildings that were burnt to the ground and destroyed. Included in the rubble of that fire was the then named Universalist Church of the Good Shepherd. During this time of devastation, another member of the Universalist Church uh, congregation came on the scene. He was a good friend of GE's and his name was George Ennis Jr. George Jr. quickly became the overseer of the church's reconstruction pro project. While I can't vouch how far along his career as a famous painter was at the time, I can vouch that George was part of the new building committee. Among the notes and recollections of GE's son, my great-grandfather, Granville Edwin Noblet Jr., was this written account. After the first Universalist church burned, Mr. George Ennis Jr. came to him, GE, one day and said, we need a church and I want you to design and build us one. For George Jr., it was simple. GE was the man. Sometime prior to laying the foundation, this location was chosen where the church now stands. Reading from GE's 1953 obituary, which you happen to have on the table in there, my great-grandfather's recollections were confirmed as the article recorded some of GE's legacy, and I quote, he founded the GE Noblet Hardware Store. He was president of the Sponge Exchange Bank and was largely influential in organizing the first board of trade of which he served as president. He was one of the originators of the plan to divide Hillsborough County to form Pinellas County and a member of the group which carried out the plan for division. He was by faith, a member of the Universalist Church of the Good Shepherd, which he built here. And the article continues, but that's where I'll stop. In closing, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this historic landmark celebration and the additional opportunity to honor and remember the contribution made from not just one of Tarpon's founders, but a former member of your congregation, Granville Edwin Noblet Sr. May you long remember that one of your own built this house. Congratulations and on this special occasion. This is the book, Once Upon a Bayou, that Jill authored. And you can meet her in the forum room afterwards and she has complimentary copies and just even more information to share than what we just heard. Thank you, Jill. All right, so let's do some recognition here. First of all, I want to mention that uh, we have some current day professional artists, actually several in our congregation, but in particular, Karen Strobing and Bill Luxinger, uh, who live right across the street, and they are with us today. I saw them earlier. Um, and they have some paintings that we have in the forum room, as well as the George Ennis Jr. paintings and a lot of historic artifacts. So please have a tour of the sanctuary in the forum room afterwards. So uh, with the city today, we have um, Karen Lemons, I believe. Karen? Hey. Hello.
and um, we have Robin Sanger, who is the founder of Peace for Tarpon. Here you are, Robin. And we also have, representing the Chamber of Commerce, Jack Spurk, my Jack. And Jack's partner, Renee Torres, is someone we know very well because Renee uh, worked on the project to redesign this church after the sinkholes and was the project leader in the early years of the restoration process. So we're glad that you could be here with us today. I'd also like to introduce the specific in, uh, individuals in our congregation who volunteer to help us work through the application process. So we've got John Ferguson, And his partner, Joe Weinstein, didn't officially volunteer to be on the committee, but boy, we put him to work. <laughs> he was voluntold, I think. And then Charlie and Jean Nelson, who helped with so many things. Where are you guys? And Barbara Kataka, who could not be with us today, but she did a lot of behind the scenes work on the history and uh, introduced, connected us with Jill. So we very much appreciate Barbara. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn Whitelaw now, the, who is the former director and curator for the Lipa Ratner Museum and has been uh, our arts consultant and a uh, longtime friend of this church. Thank you. Um, in the 1870s, several groups of Northern investors made the long, arduous journey travel to Cedar Key and then took a steamer south along the Gulf Coast to the area around the Anacloth River. They did this looking for investment opportunities they believed would follow with the eventual arrival of the railroad. From maritime activities to land development to extolling the benefits of the climate, they saw great potential for citrus, agriculture, tourism, winter residency, and establishing the area as a health resort. Their interest paid off in the 1880s. Hampton D Diston bought four million acres of land on the west coast of Florida, which were sold from the porch of the Safford House, which wasn't right there, but just over there at the time. Um, the railroad would come. Hotels were built to accommodate winter visitors, the United States government erected a state-of-the-art lighthouse at the mouth of the Anclote River as an investment in the area's future. And wealthy northerners bought land around Spring Bayou to build impressive winter homes, establishing this area as a seasonal destination for the Gilded Age elite. The town of Tarpon Springs was established in 1887 with a purported population of 52 full-time residents. Two years earlier, a group of 14 affiliates of the Universalist faith, that rec kind of represents a pretty good proportion of the uh, town's population, met and formed the Church of the Good Shepherd. This was the second Universalist church established in Florida that would have its own building. Members included, as we've heard, Governor Safford, his sister, Mary, uh, Dr. Mary Safford, the first female medical doctor in Florida, the Reverend Henry Webster, who ran the church, uh, and other like-minded, well-educated progressives with liberal spiritual beliefs for social and cultural consciousness made the church a very positive contributor to the town's growth. In the 1890s, for four winters, the most famous artist in America at the time, George Innes, came to Tarpon Springs for its climate and health benefits in the last years of his life. He created 22 paintings here and put the name Tarpon Springs on most of them. After his death in 1894, Innes's paintings with titles like Tarpon Springs, Early Morning, Tarpon Springs, Dusk, Tarpon Springs, Moonlight, and others were shown all over the United States and in Europe. And as America's most celebrated artist, that reference to Tarpon Springs 
did more to promote this city as a city of the arts than any chamber of commerce could ever do. In 1902, George Ennis's son, George Ennis Jr., also a painter, having the father's name wasn't a good thing to have as a painter, married into great wealth, another not so good for a, a struggling artist, but he was a prominent influencer of the late Gilded Age. He came to Tarpon Springs along with his wife, Julia, to establish a winter residence. They bought the home of his father, had rented on West Orange Street, just two blocks from here, uh, which they greatly expanded into Ennis Manor, built a large art studio and several cottages on the back property where Ennis built a winter artist colony that was active up until his death in 1926. The strength of the arts legacy left in Tarpon Springs is a legacy unrivaled in Florida and perhaps even in the United States. The relationship of this church and the idea of Tarpon Springs as a city of the arts is strongly intertwined. If you stay today to view the pantheon of paintings George Ennis Jr. purposely created for this church and the other works in the collection, including two award-winning paintings done in France at the end of the 19th century and then were sent to Tarpon Springs, as well as his large Sunset on the Bayou painting, you will sense the remarkable gift of artistic philanthropy. Many of the works George Ennis created for this church are now over 100 years old. This church has been an extraordinary steward for the cultural legacy, by for the caring, conserving, and public, uh, providing public access to literally thousands of visitors over the years, despite the more recent challenges that the UUCTS has faced. In April 2019, George Ennis Jr. was inducted into the Florida Artist Hall of Fame located in the State Capitol Rotunda in Tallahassee through a nomination written by this church. It should be noted that Tarpon Springs has more inductees into the Artist Hall of Fame than any city in Florida with the exception of Miami. And that's pretty big thing to say for Little Tarpon Springs. This further validates the historic importance of Tarpon Springs as a community of the arts. The dedication of this historical marker acknowledges the contributions of the Unitarian Universalist Church to that legacy and the importance it has played in the development of Tarpon Springs, wait for him to go by, for 138 years. This is a reputation we should all be exceedingly proud of for this recognition. Thank you. There's one more guest I'd like to recognize, and that is Ron Haddad with the Tarpon Springs Ministerial Association. All right, well now for the moment we've been waiting for. Actually, we've been waiting 138 years to do this. Baby. Baby. Yeah. A lot of words, a lot of history on it. Uh-huh.